If you're on LinkedIn and you're not following Sarah Richmond, you're depriving yourself of joy. Plain and simple. I like joy. So I follow Sarah, a freelance copywriter and the somewhat disputed world record holder for number of cowlicks. I was also fortunate enough to speak with her on this latest episode of the Desuckify Work podcast. The conversation was delightful. Not in a sunshine and butterflies kind of way, although we had our moments. It was delightfully human, complex, nuanced, dark at times, hopeful elsewhere, always real and full of laughter, (laughs) even at some of the not so bright and cheery stuff. This is what Sarah brings to the world, a complex, honest, searching perspective that is exactly what we need more of in the work world, if you ask me. Less prepackaged BS and more soul exhausting depth, which is oddly energizing. We should share more of our pain, more of our uncertainty, more of our hanging by a fingernail hope. We should connect in all the ways that bring us together and help us realize we need each other, all of us, if we stand any chance of desuckifying anything. I think this conversation is a great start. I hope you do too. Okay, Sarah Richmond, welcome to the Desuckify Work podcast. Hey, happy to be here. I'm excited to have you here. You're uh, one of my favorite people that I follow on LinkedIn. Um, and I think uh, I think people will be uh, pleased to hear from you and get your perspective on all things uh, desuckification. Well, if not, uh, they'll never get the time back that they spent. Listening. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, no refunds. Sorry. <laughs> um, so before we go too deep here, let's just uh, let people know who you are. What's what's your story? What are you doing for work and how did you come to be doing it? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so I'm a single mom with two kids. Okay. And um, I knew I wanted to write since I was a teenager. It was pretty mm-hmm. much the only outlet I had when I was really, really depressed and hated my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to college and I got a degree in English with an emphasis in creative writing. And mm-hmm. I was so burned out on writing by the time I finished that I didn't really write for a while. And I got a job in um, insurance. <laughs> ah, the, the classic path. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, wrote off and on really casually for a while and then did some editing uh ended up working for amazon's print on demand uh and disc on demand company and Mm -hmm. um and then stayed home with my girls when they were little yeah and when i became a single mom i didn't know what the hell to do with myself Mm -hmm. um so in order to provide them with as much stability as possible i knew it needed to be from home like a job from home so i started Mm -hmm. teaching english to chinese kids okay and that was pretty fun yeah um but it wasn't going anywhere so to speak and Mm -hmm. i that was a period of just intense, like necessary courage. It mm-hmm. wasn't like a question of whether I wanted to be courageous. I just had to be. Yeah. And one of the things I realized is that every new season requires you to be just as courageous or even more so. And I could tell that I needed to sort of gird my loins again and and move out into more of what I actually really wanted to do in my heart of hearts. And that was to write. Mm. And so I, I had been homeschooling my kids as well. Mm-hmm. And I put them in public school. And then three months later, they came back because of COVID. So that was hilarious. Okay. Okay. Um, I tried to get hired um, by some agencies. And uh, I remember thinking everything has been moving at the speed of light. And I've been out of the workforce for you know a few years. This I was so intimidated. Mm. And it probably, it probably shown through. But without yeah. uh, anything impressive to, to show people, really, um, no, nobody wanted me. Mm. It was sort of hysterical. Um, how quickly I got rejected <laughs> again and again and again. If it makes you feel any better, people who have worked in this business for many, many years can get rejected just as quickly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's brutal. It's uh, it's wonderful to it's terrible and wonderful to have that camaraderie with people. But yeah. yeah. So in sort of a not like in a resentful way, but I got to the point where I just said, fuck this. If nobody wants me, I'm just going to go out on my own and do it freelance. And I didn't even really understand what that would entail. Mm -hmm. And so I started talking to friends who had their own businesses and seeing if I could just practice with them. Mm -hmm. Um, And from that, I started getting, um, I I was supplementing uh, writing with with editing at that point. Um, And that worked pretty well. And I ended up flipping, by the time that first full year ended, I had 
was maybe at a, like a pretty even break between the two. And mm-hmm. then by the next year, it was like 80, 20. And then after that, I mean, I, I still do some, some editing, but it's not very often. And it's basically just when I feel like it. Um, but yeah, so here I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I like the, the journey because it, it, it is not traditional. Um, and I think that that, to me, a, a lot of what, what is fun to dive into with, with people and just in general, even with some of the coaching work I do is to help people see that like, you don't have to, I mean, it sounds like a lot of this was by, by necessity for you, but like, that's okay because you can still then create something, you know? And I think, I think people often feel they have to follow whatever the path was that somebody else took. And it's like, no, you can figure out your own path. It may may not always be pretty, but like you find something. And that that I think is important for people to realize, probably more so now than ever, because so many people are getting dumped into the world of freelance and doing your own thing and figuring it out because companies are just laying lots of people off and all that stuff. So I I think that's a a nice example of just like you said, kind of necessary courage, but but you found it, it was there and, and you actually created something. And I mean, certainly for anybody who's followed you on LinkedIn, I think they know that you have a wonderful writing style and I have to imagine your clients uh, enjoy the benefits of that, you know? I hope so. I mean, it seems like it. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they're like, calm it down. Just sad. <laughs> like, I think, I think that's a good place to be though. Right. Where you, you maybe go a little like, like all in on something and they're not ready for it and you can dial it back better that than like, can, can you make an interesting place? Yeah. <laughs> this is hope. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. Um, one of the things I like to ask people, and you, you obviously have a different perspective on this. So I'm curious, like the state of work right now, based on just, you know, people, you know, and maybe stuff you observe on LinkedIn, what does it feel like to you? People like people's relationship to work. Do you have a, I always say, where does it fall on the suck meter? You know, do you have a sense of that? It's so gross. It's, it's terrible. It sort of reminds me of the way I felt when I was in an abusive relationship where people mm are just being having the life squelched out of them and being mm. mistreated and devalued and dehumanized. And I think a lot of people think this is the way things are. There's no way to get out of it. Mm-hmm. I'm stuck. And that goes back to what you just mentioned, which is like, there's this idea and we're all told it and it makes mm-hmm. sense because it's how societies run. You know, we're going to give you a track and you mm-hmm. go down it, but yeah. it's that this is just the way things are. We, we there's no other way. And, mm-hmm. um, it's really depressing. It's why I take regular, it's one of the reasons I take regular breaks from LinkedIn because yeah. it's, I, I don't know that I could call myself an empath because it's, I think maybe do you have to be diagnosed for that, but I'm mm. very empathic and yeah. my heart aches when I read really sad, horrible stuff. Yeah. And as much as it sounds maybe almost callous to say, like I have to turn that spigot off, mm-hmm. it's not out of like a, a lack of empathy. It's more of just because I become immobilized and grief mm-hmm. for other people. So, um, yeah, I I don't know that I said anything of value just then, but it's it's trash and I hate it for everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I, I, you know, I think I think it's hard not to see that. Right. I mean, certainly. And, you know, there's there's part of me that wonders slash hope that maybe LinkedIn is amplifying the worst of it. And there's a whole bunch of goodness happening that doesn't get shared. But I think no matter what, there's clear truth there that with with the combination of of layoffs and i think just the way a lot of companies and industries seem to be responding mm-hmm. to that maybe that shift in power um kind of coming back to them after it maybe wasn't there for a little bit like mm-hmm. you do see people you know how people get laid off how they're treated after they're getting laid off how they're treated while they're working because people know like you have no other choices so yeah. um there there I is think- a lot of awfulness yeah yeah and i think if you ask me like well what do you think like in a general sense what would desuckify work mm-hmm. i could play the whole like politician bit mm-hmm. and tell you like here's some policies that but when it comes down to it like that's i feel like people give those prescriptions either when they don't really care or they just are so de- they're so detached from those problems so mm-hmm. like it, almost maybe from a place of privilege but mm-hmm. i think that um 
when it comes down to it, we have to focus on what we can control. And yeah, there is very little, but it is really, really powerful what we can mm-hmm. control. Yeah. Um, Cause when I was thinking about, you know, you asking me this question, I thought, well, what could I say? I could, I could stick with the practical, but I don't think I'm the person to talk about that. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. a policy person and I have mm-hmm. no power to implement any of this. <laughs> you know, it's just all theoretical. Like, wouldn't it be great paid parental leave and everybody's like, shut up. We already know. <laughs> but, uh, but I think um, if you stick with what you can control, um, not only will, not only will that um, make a difference and, and what you're doing and how you show up and how fulfilling it is, Mm-hmm. regardless of what you do. But I think it also will act as almost like a a barrier to all of those things that are true that you can't mm-hmm. control crushing you. Yeah. And, and, and um, because, you know, if I looked at my life and I, for example, looked for all the evidence to support the idea that I am a reject, I'd have a lot. Like my, my therapist actually asked me to do this exercise okay. and I a page and a half of like very specific, really painful, shitty things. I was like, yeah. here we go. Boom, 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 boom. And I actually got really tired. I was like, I don't even want to write anymore. This is exhausting. <laughs> yeah. And then she said, go in and now you're going to write all the evidence against. And it wasn't that I was trying to find things that were like even affirming. It was that I was switching out my understanding of what had happened to me. So for example, mm. if my parents rejected me, I can recognize that they would reject anybody else in my place because it was mm-hmm. a reflection of stuff within them, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think if you are in a place where you have your back so fully, then when you do encounter like layoffs, like you mentioned and people mm-hmm. treating you like crap, not only will you probably do things to have your back so that you can, you know, get an exit plan, mm-hmm. but you'll be able to recognize that those things aren't based in truth. They're not, yeah they're not based, they're not predicated on your actual value. Mm -hmm. Um, And you have, I think, a better chance of getting through that without being destroyed, but also getting something of benefit from it potentially, but at the very least not being Mm -hmm. squashed like an ant. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I think there, I think it's really hard for people to see sometimes when they're in it, um, that, that you can sort of, shift the way you interpret and the way you react to the initial emotional kind of punch of some of those things and how how we do have some ability to change the way we think about things i mean that's i know in in therapy terms that's you know often used in like cognitive behavioral therapy it's like you don't have the power to change what people do to you but you have the power to change the way you think about it and and that if you can change your thoughts that can actually change the way you feel um you know and and that's that's a hard thing to get in the moment but but it is powerful i think um because if you're gonna try to find a new path for yourself if that's ultimately what's needed it's really hard to do if you just feel like you're a reject or if you feel like you've been beaten down every day and that's like you're in that so yeah i think that's as great advice and i think there's lots of people out there who who speak to that and can like help you and like obviously if you need the help of a therapist or anyone else to get through that you should because um i think like once you obtain the ability to do that yeah not only like you said does it change the way all of that stuff hits you but it does allow you to maybe actually change things in your life. Yeah, I think it restores your agency because Mm -hmm. if you, if you again, predicate your value and your ability and anything else about yourself on the shitty things other people do to you, Mm -hmm. you, you can't get anything done. I mean, that's actually what holds me back the most. I feel like I've been really challenged by a lot of people in my life lately to, to up my game and everything they're saying is true and right and good and smart. And I keep thinking, what is going on with me? Why do I want to hide in a blanket fort? And it's because <laughs> I'm so scared of success. I think I'm going to muck it up as soon as mm-hmm. it starts really happening. And so I want to self-sabotage. I want to run away, you know? So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think um, it, what's funny, though, is I had someone point out that some of the people who've, who, who've done things that were hurtful to me I've taken their word as truth or their actions as truth, even Mm -hmm. though I would not take anything else they say as truth. Mm -hmm. Isn't that that so silly? Like I could look at that person and say, they 
are the opposite of anything that I would want to emulate. And I know they're pathological liars. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't value anything else about their life. But if they tell me I'm trash, I'm like, oh, oh my God, I'm trash. <laughs> That's really interesting, right? Because I, I totally get that. Like I, I, there are people who have said things about me or whatever or done things. And, and I objectively know I don't value that person's opinion on anything. Like, I don't know if it's like, it's this accumulative effect of like once any kind of hurt has layered into us that we believe it on some level. And so if anybody confirms it, mm -hmm. we just, if we just add it to our like story. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it depends for me. It depends on what it relates to. There's sometimes I can just laugh and maybe, maybe I got more sleep that week. I don't know, but sometimes yeah. it does feel like, Oh, they're right. And everything is on fire and it's an emergency. And then, mm -hmm. then a few hours later, you're like, hold on a minute. <laughs> person is actually trash you know i don't know so yeah yeah no i think uh i think that's just part of you know you know i think when we talk about things like work so much of this stuff gets gets left to the side in these conversations like it's it's much more you know here's a list of 10 things you can do and you know they're not wrong things like but we're, we're sometimes taking the sort of like reality of us as emotional beings and, and shoving it over here and going, here are things you can, you can do that are very practical and all that kind of stuff, which I think the only way you get to even entertain those thoughts is, is if we actually acknowledge that everybody is showing up to life and therefore to work with a bunch of emotional things going on. And okay. if you fail to acknowledge that, you're certainly not going to get people showing up with the best of what they can do. And I, th I would think, and this is, you know, if I were running a large company, I would want people to show up and at least be as close to their best as possible. And whatever could help with that, um, I would want to do. I know that's a little bit of that, like, I don't have the power to do that right now, so I can't change it. But I think the conversations around work, I think it's getting better, but they're often very like just do this thing and just follow this protocol and read that book and do the thing and i think those are all important but it really starts with we are human beings who show up with with our emotional stories and if we can't find a way to move through that and, and take the good from that and then deal with the bad from that it's never going to work. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if there's a question in that, but I'm curious, like, does, does that resonate for you? Yeah. I mean, I think that some of those lists are just a testimony to the fact that we want to circumvent that hard work in mm -hmm. ourselves. Because yeah. it is hard work and nobody can do it for us. We need people alongside of us. I, I believe, for example, that we heal in community. Mm -hmm. which is why even workplaces are, are really important um, yeah. emotional atmosphere and support there. Mm -hmm. But I think we often want to, we want to just avoid that stuff. And we want the, the equational transactional sort of, I, I use the word sterilized a lot and it like stripped down, mm -hmm. not even really human uh, yeah. experience because that's quantifiable and that's something we can replicate and that's something we can control. And it doesn't mm -hmm. feel as terrible. It feels sort of like, yeah, you know, we've, we've somehow achieved like a, a poopless reality, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's not going to happen. And that's why, yeah. and I've had people challenge me on this when I say, I think most people, some people really hate their humanity. They wouldn't mm -hmm. pose it that way. And they yeah. might if I say that. I think, Oh, that sounds really almost, like violent. And mm -hmm. what I mean is if you don't like everything about you, that is evidence that you're human, then you do hate being human. Like, yeah. And I get it because sometimes I'm so tired of my variable energy levels and the fact that I, you know, I have a health condition mm -hmm. and uh, that I don't always sleep well and, and just how dumb, stupid traffic and other things get in the way or mm -hmm. that I get pissed off and knocked off course by, you know, my ex-husband doing something. I, I want to mm -hmm. just be that buttoned up, gritty get her done sort of robot yeah. lady and i'm not and i never will be and the irony is that the things that are like what i think the most beautiful and powerful and lovely things about me are are um manifestations of those weaknesses mm. of that humanity i cannot mm. have the beauty without the liabilities you mm. know god yeah 
I, I think there's so much truth to that. And I've never heard it expressed that way. The idea that like people hate their humanity. And I, I get why somebody might bristle at that. But when I heard it, I was like, yeah, because I know on some level I've felt that at times. I mean, I think it comes back even to like when you said, I want to, I want to hide in a, in a blanket fort or whatever. Like, I think sometimes that's that feeling. It's like being a human just feels like too much. I want to just shut it all down. That's like the, the sort of, uh, closed down reaction. And then the, the, the big reaction is, I'm a robot, right? I will just sort of plow through life without emotions in this poopless society, right? And it's like, um, I do think, you know, and I don't know where this comes from. I don't know if it's just uh, a history of recognizing some people who have somehow found a way to be quote unquote great. And then we all think, I, I can't do that. I, I have all these things I have to deal with. I could never do that. Therefore, I hate the fact that I have all these things I have to deal with. They probably don't. And meanwhile, they did, but they they found a way through. Yeah. No, I. Uh, it's gotten better, but I noticed a pattern in me that anytime my kids, and, and I've mentioned to you before, they both have rare health conditions. Anytime mm-hmm. something crappy happens with them or anytime something's going on, hey, what's going on? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go. <laughs> Anytime something's going on with my health or yeah, just, you know, I don't resent being a single mother at all, but uh, uh, just sometimes when the, the unique circumstances that are, I guess you could say difficulties in my life prop up or my ex-husband does something, I just, I have spiraled where I think, okay, see, this is evidence. I can never be successful. Nothing's ever going to work out. Everything's trash. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and uh, I realized, I mean, on the surface level, you could just call that a cop out. <laughs> but that lacks nuance and mm-hmm. it, it, it lacks grace. And if I could hate myself into being awesome, I already would have done it by now. So I've, <laughs> I've tried to sort of rear back out of my heels and say, you know, how can I be compassionate toward myself mm-hmm. and, and that be the way to, to propel me forward? Cause I haven't, like I said, I haven't found a way otherwise. Like if no. I just say, why are you such a piece of crap? Why can't you get it together? It doesn't actually mobilize me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think recognizing that, even though there are difficulties in my path, that does not preclude me from success as I want to define it. And mm-hmm. if I believe that, then I might as well give up. And I don't want to give up. I don't, yeah. I truly don't want to give up. So mm-hmm. like even, even just recognizing that helped me to, to like, there's like a pause now in between crappy things happening and me before I go, I can't. And I'm like, no, 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 come back. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm, I'm better able to, to stop that freight yeah. train before it, you know, blows over me. Well, I think like, you know, again, it's interesting, right? That that self-talk of like, you know, I suck. Why can't I do this? Like, you know, you said, well, that never motivated me. And it's like, think of like, you think about like, well, if somebody else talk to, talks to you that way, does that motivate you? And it's like, <laughs> Punch no, like, like, get the hell out of my way. Like, stop. Yeah. Like, so like, again, like we have this ability to talk to ourselves in a way that like, if others talk to us that way, we would immediately recognize like, you're not helping me. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, I, like, I've not abide that. Right. But yet, but, but yet we somehow allow it in ourselves. And, you know, you said something else as you started talking about like, <clears throat> you know, being successful. And, and, and again, I think we all define that differently, but uh, there's this, I don't know if this is true for you, but I know this has shown up for me at times when I, when I picture success, sometimes it's, it's over here somewhere. And maybe there's somebody who has a version of it that kind of looks like, okay, that's kind of what I want. Yeah. And like, it can be really hard for some reason. I know this is self-sabotage maybe, but like, there's some voice that says, well, you, that, that's not you, you, you know? You know what I uh, what has come up recently? I thought that probably the deepest thing that I needed to, to contend with was the belief that I am not enough. And mm-hmm. recently, <laughs> I found something deeper, okay. <laughs> more gnarly and gross. And it connects to that. It connects to the self sabotage mm-hmm. and the, the idea that like I can't, I can't get that success. For me, it was like I don't deserve it. And it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. It's the I am a reject. I don't deserve mm-hmm. it. And also, like I have to earn it, and I haven't earned it, right? Mm-hmm. And and so, like those two together. I don't know if you were sort of taught that growing up. Like I have to earn everything, and mm-hmm. whatever earning means. Earning generally means like 
why well, it doesn't really mean anything because it's yeah. it's a moving goalpost, right? If you talk right. to somebody like you need to put in 20 years, right? You mm-hmm. know, or never ask for a raise. Mm-hmm. But um, if you if you don't if you believe that at least for me that on a fundamental level you were a reject, then you don't deserve good things. Mm-hmm. And anytime they they present themselves to you, even just you know cognitively, you'll push them away one way or the other. You'll find a way to push them yeah. away. And yeah. for me, that that has manifested as self sabotage. Even though I think on the surface, people wouldn't even be able to tell that that's what I was doing. They might wonder why I didn't act on something, but that's mm-hmm. the most they they wouldn't know that like, you know, I'm hiding in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I that that connects to, for me a lot, and I and I think I have to imagine a lot of people have some version of that story going on and and what <clears throat> what i wonder you know i don't i'm sure this book exists but but the the book of somebody who who legitimately felt that for a long time and then sort of found their way to to just reject the reject story and okay. go no and then showed up and and created the thing that looked like success for them um yeah. you know it I, it's, it's I heard a book like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to, I don't remember the full author's name, but I'll, I'll maybe we, you can add it to the show notes or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think we need more stories like that because a lot of times stories that you hear about success, they may actually contain that, but it's mm-hmm. not really part of the story you read. It's, it's sort of underneath it. And, and so then it can look like, oh, somebody did a bunch of things that, that I know I won't do because at some point I'll, I'll sabotage it because I, I just, I'm a reject and I can't go through it yeah. versus, oh, somebody actually is telling me about how they bumped up against that story a bunch of times and then they found a way through. And so that, um, you know, when it comes to the, the, the sort of very practical advice of how to like achieve your dreams versus the reality. I, I feel like the more we can just invite people to share that side of their story, like the fact that like somebody who's currently standing in a place that looks pretty good. And from your perspective might be like, yeah, I, I could see wanting some of the things that they've achieved. Like it, it's easy for it to get glossed over and just feel like they just quote unquote earned it by taking steps one through 10 versus yeah. like, no, I got knocked around a whole bunch and I, just didn't believe I was ever worthy of getting here. And then I somehow found a way to get past that, which, um, you know, even as I say that, I'm like, well, that's obviously not enough. There's more to that story. <laughs> sure. I also think that there's no real arrival point. Yeah. We that's like a good point. Like there is, we like to yeah. act like there is, you know, yeah. um, success in and of itself, it, it sort of presented as this, this ultimate, this, mm. this this finish line, and it's not. And if we go back to what we were just talking about with the real work being internal, mm-hmm. then of course that never ends, and all yeah. the external work is just sort of, in a sense, very secondary or tertiary. And mm-hmm. it's not that it doesn't matter. It's a in in a, in a large sense a manifestation of what where we are, you know, yeah, inside and what's going on. Um, mm. So I, I, you know, I, I come from a faith tradition that hyper-spiritualized everything. And I, I don't want to do that here and now, but I definitely do think that what we, the people we are becoming is way more important than the work we're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I like that perspective. There's a, um, there's an exercise, um, that I've I've worked with a little bit through through coaching and other stuff and it's it's called be do have. Mm-hmm. And so the the have is is kind of what we sort of were alluding to with some of the success, meaning like I have a career that that I enjoy and you know makes me enough money so that I can, you know, put food on the table or whatever goal you have there. And then the do is kind of like, okay, I need to, I need to work hard. To, to achieve that. But the B is, I think, what you're talking about. Who do I need to be so that I have yeah. those things? And so yeah. it, it can be, we can often focus on the like the thing we want to have or the thing we need to do versus the, the person we want to be. And that that can sort of oddly then reconfigure the, the do and the have because mm-hmm. it's like, Oh, once I realize who I want to be, maybe what I want to have is different, but also it maybe opens the door 
to actually having that thing when I finally figure out who I want to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I wouldn't say it's impossible because I don't think that's fair, but it's really difficult to receive into our lives things that we are not psychologically ready for like mm -hmm. that we're shut off from, you know? Yeah. 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 Definitely. So if, if somebody asked you right now, are you successful? What would your answer be? Oh, according to whose definition? <laughs> uh, any yours when um, my five years ago self would say hell yes i'm really fucking proud mm -hmm. myself well yeah. um myself today struggles with that because i definitely feel like i am just much slower than I wish I were not, you know, with deadlines, I meet all my deadlines <laughs> you know, just with, with, uh, growing and putting myself out there and, um, different ways that I know concrete ways that I know I can, you know, I can level up. Um, mm -hmm. but when I, sometimes when I do feel frustrated by where I am, um, I get a sense of, almost like someone's sort of tugging on my shirt sleeve. And I think, Oh, Sarah, don't you remember what you wanted to begin with? You know, yeah. it was not a maximum number of hours or accolades or a bunch of people on LinkedIn who love me or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was the ability to be present for my children, to mm -hmm. be a safe person for them. Um, the ability to go piddle around in my garden sometimes mm -hmm. to write fun things on the side for other reasons that weren't work related mm -hmm. and the ability to help people and to show up, you know, as you already know about me in a way that's just oozing humor and empathy. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mean, I love writing and I like just the, the, the fundamentals of helping people through writing, but I do think that what I do, even in small ways, even in just like an, an email update can have, mm -hmm a significant impact on people's days. I mean, I've mm -hmm. had times when people have told me your email made my morning and it was some stupid, silly shenanigan. And, <laughs> but those are the things that just like, I'll remember stuff like that for years when people yeah. do the same for me. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, to me, those enrich my life so much that it's, it feels not to be super trite, but it feels like a privilege to be able to do that for others. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of a, uh, a heart's cry for me that yeah. that is that is who I would be mm. well what I love that and I, I I can I can picture that because I know when I get just anything that just gives me a little smile or read something and it could be you know when I'm on LinkedIn it's certainly stuff that you write and there's other folks who just just continuously sort of find a way to make me smile that <clears throat> that that changes my day. Like, it's not just like, Ooh, I had a two second smile. It's like, it literally affects me. So like, there's a lot of power in that, that maybe sometimes we don't give ourselves credit for that. Like we can do something that, that, that affects people more than just simply like, Ooh, I feel good. Cause I, I wrote something fun. It's like, no, I wrote something that then had an impact on people. And then somebody noticed it and actually said something about it. Um, and then it gets back to that like definition of success and like, you know, there's, there's the definition from five years ago, you, which it sounds like every once in a while you do get reminded like, Hey, <laughs> you have achieved those things. You are that person. Um, and then there's just the reminder of like those kinds of things, like that's a version of success. And, and I think we're really good at dismissing those things and just going, eh, that's, a, that's not really it. And it's like, huh? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but how do how can you just allow yourself to feel and and experience the the joy from that moment so that it gets sort of filed in your I'm a success. I'm I'm living a, a life that I love because of that and not necessarily because I got, you know, 72 more likes on my next LinkedIn post, you know. Do you, do you find the ability to really hold on to some of those bits for yourself? Yeah, th in some ways, I think part of that has just been um, not taking what quote unquote successful people say for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful, you know, 
way. Like I don't give a crap about what you say, you know, yeah. it's just, there are so many prescriptions for life that people dish out because they're quotable because they go viral because they mm-hmm. have their own agendas uh, because it's easier to go with like top level stuff versus nuance. Mm-hmm. All the reasons. But um, if I am constantly digesting those and, and, sort of toying with them, then I'm going to get really depressed. <laughs> but if I sort of hold myself in this, I don't know if it could be called gracious cynicism. Um, hmm. And I draw it back to like what I want. And I think some of that has to do with like slowing down, especially at the beginning of the day. Mm-hmm. How, whatever that looks like. I don't know if, if, if for some people it's just drinking tea, but when I slow down and I visit my, my day, as far as what I'm trying to do, that does help me root myself in, Mm-hmm. In, in what matters. And it's not even always a conscious thing, you know, like mm-hmm. where I'm like, oh, and this is how I want my life to look and <laughs> doing amazing high fives, Sarah. <laughs> but it just, it keeps me from rushing into the day yeah. and then thinking I didn't get as much done. Or I, and I feel like th- sometimes it's almost like water droplets where one, one discontented thought that relates to like those false ideas of, of, mm-hmm. of success will just lead to more and more and more. And then before I know it, I'm like, I want to light everything on fire (laughs) versus just when I'm going slow, just a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy life more and I remember what matters to me more. And Mm. um, it's really satisfying because I think one of the, the biggest sadnesses that I are, I don't know what I would call it. The the saddest things that I see in, in the world today is just how, everything around us is pushing us to to live fast. Mm. And when we're living fast, it's really hard to get a sense of what the heck is even going on and why we're doing it. And it's no wonder that people do that for decades. And then they get to the point where they're like, okay, I'm going to burn my whole life down and restart Mm -hmm. it because they think it was all for nothing. Yeah. And so slowing down just a little bit. And I don't, I think even if we do get to that point, it wasn't, all for nothing. I'm not saying that, you know, yeah. they've made a bunch of mistakes, but right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm sure a lot of people relate to that because it does often feel like whatever version of life you sort of find yourself in, if, if you haven't really had the ability to be slower and intentional about it, it's like you're jumping into rapids and then you're just now dealing with what happens when you're in rapids. So like all the things you could do if you were in a lazy river and the way, like the way you could experience that and you could have certain, like you could ponder things and you could have like meaningful conversations with the fellow traveler next to you when you're in rapids, like you're sort of in this survival mode. Right. And now you're just like, you're right on the edge of everything. And I think so much of work and career can feel that way. Mm-hmm. And you, you almost didn't like intentionally even get into that. It's just kind of like you, you know, life just says, okay, now you're, now you're in those rapids. And then for some people, like finally they do climb out and yeah, you did learn a lot of things. You figured out some things about who you are and your ability to survive things. And, and those are good things. Um, but, but I, I think we all feel that pace coming on us. And it's like, you know, this kind of comes back to the ability of what you can control, meaning there's a lot of stuff happening at pace and we can't stop that, Mm -hmm. but but we can change our relationship to it and show up with, yeah, it is maybe just having a cup of tea in the morning or whatever it is you do. You know, for me, sometimes it's just going out in the morning to, to water the plants. Like, it's just like, it seems like nothing, but it affects because during that 15 minutes, I'm not in the rapids. Yeah. You know, I and, think that, um, you know, to go back to your question, cause I don't feel like I answered it that well, but when, when I let myself break the rules, mm-hmm the standard rules for success, Mm -hmm. not only am I more fulfilled and, and happier, Mm -hmm. but I found that a lot of times it works. Yeah, (laughs) It works. And I don't have a precise reason for that, except that I think that when I've come across people who are fully embodying themselves and Mm -hmm. just showing up, they're magnetic. Yeah. I mean, there are a few people in my life I will never forget them. And the things mm-hmm. they taught me without even trying to just by 
my being there witnessing who they were Mm -hmm. um, that that will stay with me, you know, forever. And so I, I guess I would say, you know, if I were sort of addressing your audience and, you know, how do you, how do you sort of define success for yourself and how do you show up in ways that aren't, you know, caught up in the rapids? It would be, Mm -hmm. it would be that you're allowed to check out of those, those prescriptions you're Mm -hmm. allowed to be like i'm getting off here peace out you know and that you don't have to buy into because there's life is nuanced there there is Mm -hmm. no one defined route for success there can't be because if that's the case then like five people get to be successful right (laughs) their lives are so messy and hard and people are sick and have financial issues and all kinds of stuff Mm -hmm. so like they they get to decide how they want to show up. And I, and I know that, you know, someone could say, well, that's, that's idiotic, but I think that recognizing your limitations and recognizing what you really want in your life is an important aspect of it because you can play the whole it, success has to be fast and it has to look like this and it has to be in this industry. And it has, mm-hmm. I have to, and, and fine, but I feel pretty certain that that's, that's not going to lead to what, they truly wanted like because mm-hmm. very rarely does it fit into those parameters it's yeah and it's it's lovely to it's lovely to be able to honor yourself and your circumstances and your mm-hmm. limitations yeah while you sort of plod toward what you want and mm-hmm. if you if you don't do that i think it's almost inevitable that you come to hate yourself mm-hmm. and everything around you and just yeah. every all the ways that like the journey is sort of happening instead of enjoying it as you go. Mm -hmm. I like that idea of like, you know, you talk about honoring your limitations and I think in some ways there's, there feels like there's something there to me. And because I think if you don't honor them, you resent them. And I think that's where a lot of us can live at times. It's like, why can't I do that the way X person seems to be able to do it? Or even the way I think I should be able to do it or the way I used to be able to do it. Um, and, and I think you then, they, they sort of own you versus if you honor them and, ex, and sort of know that they're, they're a part of you. Um, and, and, and also recognize like we all have them. Like no, there is no magic person out there who is limitation free. Um, th- then you, you sort of like the energy naturally moves where it wants to move and where it should move versus you constantly spending energy, like trying to punch that limitation or those limitations out of your life. Um, and then you have no energy for the, the natural flow towards the, the good stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And none of this comes from a place of, I like things to sound beautiful. So I'm going to say something that sounds lovely that I think life should be like, it's, it's because I did the opposite for yeah. decades, oh, I, yeah. and, you know, and, and I, I, the strength I found is in, um, you know, honoring my limitations. It's in, it's mm-hmm. in respecting what I can and cannot do at different points. And it's, um, it's finding the things that um, are lovely in the middle of the chaos. I mean, it's a good thought there. I mean, and how did, how did you find that? I mean, you talked about, you know, a, a previous relationship that was abusive and other challenges that you've gone through. Like it, it can be quite natural to, to, to live in that and then not go to the place of, of humor and empathy and, you know, honoring your limitations and all those things. How did you, you know, it kind of comes back to that phrase, I think necessary courage. Like, were you surprised that you, the courage showed up for yourself to kind of get through some of that and then show up to a place where humor and empathy are guiding you through life? Oh, that's a hard question, TJ. <laughs> I, 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 I think I think some of it it feels like I can't even take credit for it because yeah. I look back at my childhood and it was it was pretty sad. Yeah. Um what marks it is is a lot of humor at the same time, but it, mm. it, it emanated from me. Um yeah. and so I didn't lose it there. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, you could say it's a coping mechanism, but I think there's I feel almost as if what's natural in me almost just doesn't have a choice but to bubble to the surface. Like if I try Mm -hmm. to stifle it, it doesn't. And that's not to say I haven't had times where I'm just so broken. Mm -hmm. 
I, I've gotten, I've got nothing, you know, I've spent lots of nights sobbing on the living room floor, but Mm -hmm. I remember one day, for example, maybe this is sort of an answer driving home from, I think dropping off my kids at school Mm -hmm. and I was really overwhelmed and really sad about a bunch of stuff because I don't know if you know, but if you get out of an abusive relationship and you have children with that person, the abuse never ends. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a constant source of grief. Yeah. Uh, and I remember feeling just real pissed off and sad. And I think maybe sort of beating myself up. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. And I stopped at a stoplight and I thought, why the hell would I go through so much to get safe and away from him? Mm-hmm. And then basically just make my life miserable by sitting here all the time and thinking life is trash. Life is absolute trash. And again, there's grieving is appropriate. I am not a fan of the whole, let's just button this up and pretend mm-hmm. that it never happened. It doesn't work. We've already yeah. covered that. Yeah. But I don't, I mean, in a sense, then all those things have won Mm -hmm. and they, you've proved them true. You have made them true yourself. And, Mm -hmm. um, I also feel like there's, okay. So I'm not a Christian anymore, but there's a verse in the Bible that says, since we are now surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I used to think right when I first became a single mom, there are so many people who've been through so many horrific, brutal things and they've been successful or they've come out on the other side and had like some kind of enjoyable life or mm-hmm. they've accomplished this or that. How can I, how can I disqualify myself from mm-hmm. what I want at this point? How can I say I'm too broken and things are too hard and, and it's, it, I've got everything against me, even mm-hmm. statistically speaking. Right. <laughs> so I, I guess to some extent it comes down to that, that I, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think that there's enough evidence that I can't be happy, that I can't Mm -hmm. um, do well, but it's also just a natural, it's something I cannot keep back. I just, it's, I can't control myself, TJ. I just, (laughs) like when everybody said niche down, I was like, human empathy. Yes, here we go. There we go. Well, I think like, you know, I, you know, not to, 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 I don't, I can't even pretend to know what, what you went through there, but I think underneath it, this idea that you have this essence of who you always have been, that just no matter what anybody or any circumstance tried to contain that, 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 that the you found a way out. And that's like, that's joyful. Right. I mean, that's like, um, and I think it's a, it's a reminder, like we all have that, that you inside of us, whatever that looks like. And yeah, there are times, you know, that circumstances can make that almost invisible to us, but to, to sort of, as much as you can remain like aware of and connected to who you really are, it will find a way to, to show up and to, to, to let it show up. Um, mm-hmm. Because that's the thing that, that ultimately saves us and, and gets us through to whatever we need to get through to. I mean, you know, for me, I think, you know, certainly humor in, in a similar way uh, for me. I mean, I've gone through some, some health stuff and, you know, other people in my life have, and if, if we didn't laugh, I don't even know. You know what I mean? Like I can't well, even that's imagine. What you're do. Yeah. I know. Like so. Like it's such a it's such a gift, and and it's such a. Again, like yeah. Sometimes it's like, is it a coping mechanism? Maybe in that moment it is, but Who so what? <laughs> so what? Right? Like, <laughs> thank God, on. that's about the best coping me- mechanism I can think of. And then, yeah. like you mentioned, empathy, and I think I think anybody anybody who goes through something probably like gets an extra dose of that baked in there somewhere. And if you can access it, it's really great. But yeah, for some people it is a little more natural in it, but it's another great way to like, you know, move through life. Hopefully you can direct some of it towards yourself at times, which is maybe the hardest part. Um, but I love how it shows up in your writing. Um, you know, when I think about, you know, if somebody said describe the way Sarah writes on LinkedIn, it's like, it's not a simple thing. Cause like, sometimes you, you can make somebody make some of us crack up. And then other times it's like, Ooh, you, you really tugged at the, 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 the heartstrings with this one, or you just got us like, like down this interesting path and really started feeling something. And I think, <clears throat> and some people might, you know, kind of like, 
some people are just, I'm the funny one. And some people are like, I'm the sensitive one. But you found a way to blend those two, which I really, I really like. Um, how does that, does that connect in the work you do? Like, are people appreciative, you know, because, you know, you, you say, I think in your site, humor is unignorable and empathy is unforgettable. It, do, do people accept that into the work that you do? I think that's most of the time why people want to work with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've had one time when I became a parent, it was through an agency um, mm -hmm. that this client wanted nothing that I could <laughs> offer. And that was a very short lived um, project. Mm -hmm. uh, just sort of excuse myself, but uh, yeah. in general, yes. And those are, those are the best relationships. Um, the ones who specifically come to me because of what they see me demonstrating in mm -hmm. my, my writing sort of for myself and for others. Um, yeah. and I think that, uh, those are the most rewarding for me, but they're also, I think rewarding because, you know, one of my current clients are pretty new. Uh, they told me, you know, that they were seeing really great open rates by comparison to like their former, mm. um, former email sequences they'd sent out. And, uh, so, they said, we're pretty sure we can credit it to your, to your weird subject lines. <laughs> and, <laughs> to me, an email is just like this delightful little way, potentially yeah. um, to, to poke into somebody's day and um, just make it brighter. And mm -hmm. I want to read weird emails. I like to write weird, e you know, it's <laughs> so it's, yeah, I, I love when that happens. It's, it's yeah. not everything I write. I'm not going to pretend that everything I write is incredible, mm -hmm. or fun or amazing, but um yeah, it's a lot of times people specifically call that out when they contact me. They're like, I need this. You do this for me now. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think I think what if if I could, you know, have power over something that I really don't, it's just inviting people who are looking for help with with writing or any kind of creativity to to embrace what whatever that person might be bringing to the table you know for you it's the humor and the empathy for other people it might be something else but like give them at least a chance to like show that through because whatever it is it could be weird it could be it could be serious but written in a way that it connects to you it's i think in the slew of just garbage emails we get or garbage communication we receive throughout the day if somehow like there's a little light of humanity that shows through in any of it mm -hmm. i'm interested and i think most people are interested and for whatever reason i think a lot of a lot of people might be afraid of that because it's not quote unquote best practices or whatever um but i would say like if that was like that's like probably the simplest broadest but most useful piece of advice i could give to anybody who wants uh help with their their communication is just give people a chance to see some humanity and i i bet you'll have more luck with whatever you're doing there you know? yeah i think if we could sum up sort of what we've proposed and discussed it would be that all the things that apply to the personal all the principles mm -hmm. of health and like good communication and kindness and goodness, mm -hmm. they apply to business as well. Like you can't, yeah. I say sometimes you, you can't compartmentalize character and you can't compartmentalize like um, the, the personal from the professional because they, they just, they, they go together. They, it's messy. Things are messy. But beyond that, like all the things that bring us together on a personal level are going to uh, sort of elevate and, uh, and add value to, to the professional. And I don't yeah. think that it's a weakness or foolishness to, um, to put them in bed together. <laughs> I, I think they absolutely should be in bed together. I think, but there is that weird church and state thing that happens between work and personal humanity and robot, like for whatever reason. Um, I do think it's sort of like cracks are happening. I think, like, I think maybe COVID accelerated some of that. I think people just sort of like, we're just like their humanity rose to the surface, you yeah. know, in a big way during all of that. And it was like, I can't, I can't just stuff this over in the corner right. anymore. It's showing up and let's figure out how to deal with it. I do think there's some folks who are like, get it back in the corner. <laughs> like I see that, like, you know, some of those very like, you know, aggressive, like get back in the office kind of emails. Like, I don't even necessarily think there's something wrong with wanting people in the office, but it's how you 
communicate that. Um, you know, it, a lot of it feels like gaslighting, like it didn't work before we yeah, did. We did it for three years. It worked like, like, so a lot of it just show up with humanity, say like, I like being in the office for these reasons. I think these are really fun and good reasons. This is the kind of company that I want to run. And I invite anybody who else likes it to join us. Mm -hmm. That would be so much better than show up on Monday or you're fired. You know, but yet that's the instinct that shows up sometimes for all kinds of reasons. Um, I'm going to shift gears here real quick to something much more important, which is that you are the world record holder for the number of calyx. And <laughs> I would like to know what the judging process is for that. And, and uh, you know, can I enter because I am a, a fairly calyx human. So <laughs> I may oh, challenge yeah, you I right here and now. <laughs> I have a confession. <laughs> I lied. It's oh not no! I know. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. I, You're really not really the record holder. Oh man. I feel like I could be. Does you that matter? No, I mean, I have so many. Matters. They're all over. It's truthy. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An unofficial record, and I made up the title does yeah. that count i think that's valid i think if it doesn't exist in a book anywhere then you get to say it but uh my hair goes like in a million directions that's why it's so spiky. okay you asked me about this but do you make pudding in your factory <laughs> don't tell anybody <laughs> I do love pudding, though. I will say that. I just don't make a lot of things. I like things that already show up in a jar or a container of some kind, and then I it's open broad. it. Yeah. Absolute broad. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, I, I, uh, I could try. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't have the first clue of how to make pudding, but I will tell you, I love it. I, I am a big fan. Um, but yeah, uh, I will make uh, pudding and and imagine the day that I can dethrone you from the uh, the world record holder of the most calyx. You can have your wife count them and then yes. report back to me, and uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe I'll concede my throne. Yeah, she. Uh, well, she used to cut my hair. She was a hairdresser for years, and. Um, yeah, she probably already knows. Oh God, yeah, <laughs> he, he has twelve of them, and they're <laughs> annoying. Uh, but yeah, um, well, okay. Um, on that important note, I would love to get your your thought of just. I think we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but um, you know, what is your favorite part of the work you do? Oh, see, I'll have to give a two full answer, but that's fair, right? Because it's, right. it's my niche. It's yeah. bringing joy to other people and mm -hmm. helping them feel seen. Mm. That's really cool. I don't know that a lot of people would connect to that or recognize that that's something that they can even do with their work. But I also recognize that that's like such a fundamental need for mm -hmm. so many people that that of course if we could do that and and do you think you do that through through the the listening and then sort of showing up with work that really like connects to what people have shared with you well i am constrained by what clients ask for and i definitely mm -hmm. give my honest opinion if i think mm -hmm. such and such isn't a great idea or this approach or strategy or whatever right but mm -hmm. so i don't always think that it is I don't think that it always is through what I am writing, though it's it often is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it it is through the relationships I have with them as well, because yeah. um, I get invested in their success mm -hmm. um, and and in their lives. I I can't point to a single person I've worked with up close who is not also someone I would consider a friend and an important person who I'm mm -hmm. not rooting for, mm -hmm. and I think. Um, you know, I had someone a few years ago, uh, right after I met him, he was telling, I asked him about his work and he was describing what he does. And uh, he said, ah, I probably shouldn't tell you about this. It's, it's, it's boring. And I was just like, I think caring about the trivialities is one of the most uh, profound kindnesses we can do. One of the mm -hmm. best ways we can love other people. 
Mm. And he, I think, was probably like, what the hell? But <laughs> he kept talking. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for me, uh, esteeming other people and the way I talk to them, the way I listen to them, the way I help them, the way mm. I get invested in their success is one of the best ways I can show up and one of the best ways I can serve and love and honor them. And and mm. I don't give a shit if that sounds trite. I mean it <laughs> with every ounce. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's it's both. It's it's all the ways that I show up for them. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I know that I'm going back to the very beginning when you asked me like, who are you? Where did you come from? Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that I don't have the the, the typical story or a, a ton of, you know, numbers and letters and plus signs behind my name. <laughs> uh, but I have no doubt in my mind that what I can offer people uh, in terms of of humor and empathy and just like a wholehearted investment in helping them is worth every penny and is worth, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just as much as all those letters and numbers and plus signs. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you could probably just throw some letters and numbers and plus signs in there and nobody would question you. Similar to the the Calic record, I think you get to define (laughs) that. (laughs) So if you want them, you you, you could probably add them. you know, in addition to, to both of us having a, a background in writing and, and being very calic uh, we both have quotes from Abe Lincoln on our website. Oh, um, gosh. <laughs> You're bringing up stuff that I forgot about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, how did you... Uh, how did you connect to him, his spirit, in a way that allowed you to get him to give you that quote and and use the word "doggone" as a as a matter of fact, which feels very ab to me as a guy who who kind of knows him, obviously. <laughs> My God, this is the most important question you've asked me. I think so. <laughs> okay, so let it starts with a Ouija board. I'm just yes. kidding. I made that up too. I made it up. Okay. <laughs> Total BS. Oh man. That was, I wrote that. So there's a few things on my website that are vestiges of like when I first made it and I didn't even really make it for work. So it was, it was ridiculous and it still is ridiculous. Um, but, uh, that was one of the only, that's one of the only things that's, that was there from the beginning. Cause I was like, nice. I have no one who could endorse me who is of merit. And then I was like, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> yes. He has a ton of merit. That, you yes. know, I just think I get in trouble for it. They know I don't know Abraham Lincoln. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that that's, uh, unfortunately, I have to admit the same thing that I don't actually know Abraham Lincoln either, but I, I feel like, you know, he would be a fan. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like a nice guy. Um, you know, one of uh, the questions I, I like to ask as we're starting to kind of wrap up all this stuff is, um, and again, I think we've dove into this a little bit, but if you could sort of wave the magic wand, and this maybe gives you permission to get into those spaces of things that that aren't necessarily in, in our control day to day and and make work de what, what does that look like to you? I don't say this without the knowledge that there is a price to pay, mm-hmm. but it would be that people would show up as more of who they are mm-hmm. in every sense of the word. Yeah. And I don't mean describing your bowel movements to people. <laughs> I don't mean, you know, but I, I do mean, risking vulnerability, risking mm-hmm. honesty, risking being and appearing human, mm-hmm. risking telling someone, hey, I can't even think straight because my kid's sick or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Um, yeah. I have been so surprised and delighted and healed in the past few years. And it's not just because I met people who were safe and good. It's because, mm-hmm. well, I got to plug in my computer. It's because I was willing to put myself out there Mm -hmm. and the times when I've been honest and said, actually, I need you, please. Could you not joke about that? Because blah, blah, blah. Or, Hey, Mm -hmm. I'm freaking out right now because this reminds me of this, or I'm struggling right now because my kid's about to have her fourth surgery in two years or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. And I have had so much kindness returned to me in those moments. And, and I, I think that there is, like I said, there's a price to pay if you do that. Um, with unsafe people and with people who, you know, yeah. can t- turn that around and use it against you. Mm-hmm. But I would encourage people to, to be willing to 
every now and then just try that out and mm-hmm. see what happens because um, yeah. it is so edifying. It's, it's life-changing. And um, mm-hmm. I think that a lot of times we look at policy, for example, and say, this needs to change. Mm-hmm. And that's true. But I think a lot of the times, based on the fact that we have such an ineffective government <laughs> and a screwed up world, that yeah. the change is going to have to come all the way down from like the little teeny tiny interactions we have with people and build mm-hmm. out from there. Because can you imagine if people start building vulnerability and empathy and humor into their daily interactions and then that mm-hmm. becomes sort of like uh their relationship with other people the, the foundation mm-hmm. of and then over time that becomes the culture of their workplace and over time that workplace works with other workplaces and it rubs mm-hmm. off on them like i think that you know you said humor is powerful yes it is and i think stuff like this as silly as it sounds can make a huge difference in people's lives which matter mm-hmm. and uh, potentially in, in large scale organizations and, and in policy. Um, so if, if, mm-hmm. if they're not going to change things for us, we've got to change them for ourselves. Yeah. And it starts with, with how we show up. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I think there's, there's a lot in there, but I think it resonates with me because I think you do get surprised sometimes when you do like crack the door open a little bit and let some of yourself show up. And, and there are so many people who are craving that, Mm-hmm. That they respond in kind. Yes, there are people who will not respond well, but I do think in many ways, it's like you say, it's if, if enough people start stepping into that space, it, it can't help but influence those around it. It also then exposes you to the people who are going to provide you the safety to do that. You know, if you start to show up to that, you're going to start to attract more people who respond to that in your lives. I mean, I think it's a simple, even in like, some of the stuff people share on LinkedIn, when you share something that, that feel that, that people connect to and realize like, Oh, you're, you're opening this door a little bit. Suddenly there's this vacuum and a lot of people like come to that because they're craving it. And now those people are in your world. They're in your, in your, in your space. So that as you're moving forward in your career, you've got potential advocates for you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say for the people who are, sort of in more powerful positions, um, you know, I think a lot of those people are craving it too, and they just don't think they can sort of allow that. And so, Mm -hmm. but I think you'll sort of have this little bit of an attraction of like, if if people sort of from the ground up are doing it, and then people start to notice, oh, it's okay. So I'm in a position of a little more power, maybe I can welcome some of that here and my organization become more like that. Um, And yeah, I mean, can it trickle out further? I don't know, but at the very least, if you create your own corner mm-hmm. of the world where you're you're finding either clients or companies that you can work with and peers that you can work with who share that desire, it it's pretty powerful. And it's it's kind of like the 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 sad thing about it getting to the end of your life and realizing like you never got a chance to really show up, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what I think you're offering people is, is, is just give yourself the ability to start showing up. And um, it, it, there may be some costs, but the cost of never showing up at some point, like you will just wake up one day and kind of be like, mm, why didn't I show up? So um, for whatever those, those costs might be in the short term, I, I think... I think they're worth it in the most part. I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of including any of the most extreme and egregious examples against that, but I think, you know, there may be moments where it's a little uncomfortable and that's okay. If it gets beyond that, then it gets beyond that and we need to deal with that. So I love that thought. And I, I think I can, I continue to love the sort of theme you have of like figuring out what you can change in yourself, what you can do to yourself ultimately to, to, to honor yourself. Um, that, that feels like, you know, I can jump into that today versus certain things might be like, yeah, I need, I need a thousand other people to do something before I can do it. So I think it's, it's pretty empowering to hear that. So coming off of that, are you, are you optimistic uh, about all this? Um, I guess 
to go back to what I said a minute ago, I'm not meaning to suggest that if people all show up as their authentic selves, that everything is going to be hunky dory and the yeah. government like here is your paid time off. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you said you said, do I think it's worth it? Is that what you asked me? I just are you optimistic about the sort of the the move the, the if you're thinking about that that desuckified idea that more people can sort of step into being showing up as themselves are you optimistic that that can happen i think i am and i think it's easier to be optimistic when you me are growing mm -hmm. like if you're experiencing that evolution yeah um, then and you know that as i know that i'm not anybody special um mm -hmm. It's, maybe I've got a little self awareness, but uh, then then everybody can. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, we tend to think of ourselves as either broken or unbroken. I think most of us think of ourselves as broken, mm -hmm. and then we think, well, there's no way to even retrieve who I really am or even live it out. Mm -hmm. But going back to that book that I mentioned, and I'll find you the name and the author. Yeah. One of the analogies he makes is that trauma, which can be almost anything that we go through in life, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't break us in as much as it does sort of cloak us in a layer as if mm. we're not. Mm. And peeling back those layers is the way we sort of discover and embody our, our authentic selves. And mm. so um, I think the knowledge that I've the growing awareness that I have that, that, uh, you know, I'm not inherently broken that I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just sort of discovering myself on this process mm -hmm. of discovery that, that gives me hope for other people because it hasn't yeah. been through uh, grinding it out. It's been through just slow kindnesses to myself and mm -hmm. little bits of courage and putting myself out there and, I, I end up looking around and realizing, oh, I think differently about this, or I feel better about this, or I'm stronger in this way, or I, or I don't spiral in this way, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and anybody can do that. Mm. Anybody can. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I, I like that because it's, it is very relatable. Um, I think it's easy to be in a space where we don't feel like we're growing, you know, where we are just kind of caught up in the rapids of life. And it's just like, you just sort of stay in that mode. But when you do get a chance to, to peel the layers back, it isn't magic. It isn't like, Ooh, that layer's gone. And suddenly I'm here. It is more like that moment of reflection a few years later, we were like, Hmm, that was weird. That, that would have totally set me off back then, or I would have, I would have spent, you know, six hours in my blanket fort, and I only spent, you know, two today, like, that, that's progress, right? And I, I also think that a uh, slow kindness is a really interesting phrase. And I don't know, if you were, if you were to write a book, I could see you writing a book called slow kindness. And so much of what you talked about today feels like, like, like it just fits that, um, that idea. So, food for thought in case, uh, you know, no pressure, but, uh, I I'll think, get right on it. I think people <laughs> would, well, you can take it slow. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> on that note of, of your writing and, and I think people who aren't following you definitely should. So what's the, well, actually, before I get to that, I for, almost forgot. I like to have people make sound effects on this show. Are you game for making yeah, a sound yeah, effect? Yeah. I got one. I know it. <laughs> All right. What, what do you got? What's your desuckified sound effect? Okay, so this is the sound that my old psychotic, probably like inhabited by Satan cat used to make. I'm pretty sure her mom was a, a, a crack addict, but um, she would make a little mirror sound. And I started using it as, a, as like a sound of affection or encouragement or excitement mm -hmm. to other people. And so I even write it in emails now. <laughs> <laughs> so how does one spell meow? Um, you can choose, but I most often spell it with uh, M E R R R. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that feels about right. I definitely knew there was a, at least a couple R's in there. You know? Yeah, if it's really enthusiastic and there's a stronger E sound, then you're going to need more E's. Like Meep. need more E's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anything that that comes back to the world of of, of cats uh, makes me pretty happy. So I am uh, I am very pleased with that sound effect. And and now I can ask uh, if people want 
more of, of that kind of delight in their lives, um, what is the best way for people to, to find you online? I would say LinkedIn. I'm mm -hmm. in the middle of trying to do a bunch of things to my website to make it less, to desuckify it. Uh, <laughs> there we go. And it's slow going because you know how it is. Client yeah. work first and then procrastination and then with <laughs> exactly. business exactly. development. Yes. Um, so yeah, I would say LinkedIn. Okay. Cool. Well, I, I highly recommend that people follow you there because you uh, you absolutely bring humor and empathy into the world with the things you you write and even just some of the comments that you add. So uh, it, it would be delightful if anybody chose to to follow you there. Sounds great. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. This was a really cool conversation. It was just, I think we dug into some deep and heavy stuff, but we also had a lot of fun, you know, talking about Kellex and other goofy things and cats and whatnot. So I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I hope you uh, have a good rest of your day. All right. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for tuning in to the Desuckify Work Podcast. And thanks to Sarah for bringing joy, laughter, and a life and a half's worth of wisdom to the show. You can follow Sarah on LinkedIn. No, scratch that. You must follow Sarah on LinkedIn if you value the quality of your scrolled experience. Speaking of scrolling, you should take a quick scroll through my site sometime. It's filled with helpful bits of info and lots of cats, which is all you need to live a great life, if you ask me. If you'd like to ask me about cats or how to live a great life, let's set up a free 30-minute what-the-heck-is-coaching-all-about call. Meow!